Here we go. Five, four, three. If you are a real estate investor or you want to be a real estate investor and you're interested in getting funding for your deals, regardless of what your banker or your hard money lender or your mortgage broker says to you, then don't go anywhere. We're getting ready to plug you in right here on the show to the funding. Well, welcome to the show, Real Estate Investing with Jay Connor. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. And oh my lands, have I got a big surprise for all of you viewers and listeners here to the show. I'm gonna introduce my special guest in just a moment. And I tell you what, if you are listening, say for example, on your commute to work or you're on your way home or whatever, if this show runs a little bit longer than we normally do, you definitely wanna stay plugged in because this guest that I've got on here today is gonna to share some information with you on real estate investing that will transform the way you invest in real estate. But before I introduce him, I want to remind everybody about the upcoming Real Estate Investing Cash Flow Conference that is right around the corner. Wow, three days jam packed. We're gonna have people from all across the nation coming here to the conference, and we're gonna be revealing how to find deals before other real estate investors even know they exist. Of course, we'll have private money lenders at the event for you to network with. We'll take you on the bus tour to our houses that uh, are either under rehab or we finished them. Uh, you'll get to meet important parts of our uh, team, how I work with contractors, virtual assistants, and then of course, uh, as importantly as anything else, how we automate the business to where I'm actually able to net the seven figures a year in less than 10 hours per week by having the team in place and automating the business. So, Here's the website and it's right below, right here on the screen. If you're viewing, get on over after the show and check it out at www.jayconner.com -E money podcast, all in one word, jayconner.com -E forward slash money podcast. And I look forward to seeing you there at the event. I'll be teaching all three days and uh, helping you take your real estate business to the next level. With that, I'm so excited to have as my special guest today, a dear friend of mine. We got to know each other for the first time, I guess it's been two or three years ago, Mitch Stevens. Mitch, welcome to the show. Hey, Jay, how you doing? I'm Matt, glad to be here. I'm still traveling kind of on the Christmas vacation tour, uh, you know, um, but I was so honored that you asked me to be on the podcast. I said, I don't care where I'm at, I'm going to pull over. So, so that's exactly what we're doing. I spent about a month at my ranch and then um, we got a few things to do and run around and do, but I'm glad, I'm glad to be on. Well, if you hear a big crash, just cancel the podcast. Okay. Oh my lands. I don't want to be hearing no big <laughs> crash. My word. Well, hey, look, before, before we tell the people that are uh, viewing in, um, you know, uh, we, we got YouTube channels, we've got uh, iTunes, we got Google play, we've got, and we're getting hundreds and hundreds of downloads now every day uh, from not only the U.S., but all over the world. But Mitch, tell them a little bit about your ranch that you got before we tell them about the world of Mitch Stevens. Well, I, I, I got 600 acres down there in a place called uh, Bigfoot, Texas. And uh, it's just my own little paradise. It's uh, got deer and quail and turkey and hogs and deer blinds and swimming pool and ATVs and corn feeders and rattlesnakes and that's just I don't know I just go there and <laughs> it's a new day every time I get there you know well now man you talk about rattlesnakes that reminds me of my wife Carol Joy's uh daddy and her, her grandparents used to go rattlesnake what they didn't call it rattlesnake hunting in Texas what they call it was it rattlesnake, rattlesnake roundups roundup? rattlesnake roundups probably in Savannah yeah well they also did it uh around possum kingdom yes. um which isn't too far from graham uh texas but yeah my lands when i first met carol joy out there in wichita falls texas back in 1984 i don't know what to think when i walked inside their house for the first time and here's all these rattlesnake rattlers you know framed up on the wall you know i mean where I was growing up, what they framed up and put on the wall was, you, you know, your grandparents' pictures in Texas. <laughs> in Texas, they put rattlesnake rattlers, you know, up on the wall. Well, you know, you could just outline the picture of your grandparents in the rattlesnake thing. 
<laughs> in fact, I remember seeing a frame that had the rattlesnake rattlers. But anyway, I'm going to stop rattling on right now and let's get on down to business and, and get our viewers and our listeners uh, tuned in here and, 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 and give them some uh, valuable information on real estate investing. So, Mitch, tell the folks how you got involved in real estate investing, how you even got interested in it, how long ago that was. And, um, you know, over your career, so it's a three part question starting out. How'd you get involved in real estate investing? How long ago? What's that story? What are the, all the different kinds of deals that you've done? And then what's your real estate investing business looking like today? Well, I really went to the real estate business because I failed at everything else. It was the last thing left. It's like, if I don't do this, I guess I'll just go out and shoot myself. Um, <laughs> so actually, uh, uh, on accident, I bought a condo to live in while I was bartending in my early 20s. And then it was a one bedroom efficiency. And then I bought a two bedroom because I wanted a little more room, but I couldn't really sell the condo. So I owner financed it. I mean, I rented it out. And then I figured out when I rented out the one bedroom and I rented out the extra bedroom and my two bedroom condo that I was living for free. And I thought that was pretty cool. And then, so I lived for free for a long time. Actually, I was making like 50 bucks a month off of it when things went right. Um, and then I, one day I decided I was gonna sell them all and both of them buy a house. And I sold both of them and I made more in that month when I sold those two units than when, that I made in my job in two years. And I thought, what the hell am I doing? Uh, what am I doing? And I thought, I better check into this real estate stuff. I think there might be something to it. Now, <laughs> when, I was. <laughs> now when was that? Well, I bought my first place in 19, 70 about 1983 about 1983 81 something like that and then i went a long time i started reading books and everything but you know i'd read robert allen's nothing down it took me seven years to actually own the concept that i didn't need to have money i needed it took me seven years to own it in my heart i could read it and i could understand but you know what i'm saying so there's concepts you hear and they pass through your brain and there's concepts that that you pick up that go right to your heart and you own them you know, and, and it took me a long time to own the idea that I didn't need money. Yeah. Speaking of not needing money, um, of course, my viewers and listeners, um, they know I'm known as the private money authority, but my lands, Mitch, I mean, you and me getting to know each other. I mean, you've raised a ton of uh, private money to fund your deals, but, but let's get to that in just a moment. So, oh, by the way, I want to go ahead and tell all of our viewers and listeners, um, I want to go and tell them about your book that you're going to give away like a, a portion of it here at the end of the show. What's the name of your book? It's my life in 1000 houses failing forward to financial freedom. Yeah. Now what's about the, the thousand houses? What's the thousand houses thing? Well, I, I, I sent someone to my storage. I no, I, I tried to send someone to my storage to get some documents to retrieve some documents I needed from a, a sale from a long time ago and no one could go. So I went to my store, I owned the storage facility. I went to my storage facility and I, and I got the key and I opened up the deal and I was just aghast. I mean, I looked up and there was just walls and walls to floor to ceiling of files. And I, I thought, I wonder how many houses that is. And I sent someone to, I, I got back with my papers, got my business done. And I said, you know, who wants to go to the storage and count all the files? Cause I want to find out how many files. And it was like a thousand and ten houses I had bought and I had no idea that oh there you are I was just kind of reminiscing through all those files and so I started thinking of all the stories and I decided I'd start writing the stories people said how do you how did you do that and I said well I don't know I have to go back and think about it and then it just I started documenting what I did I was even have to interview people to find out what I did because I couldn't even remember half the time you know like <laughs> Did I buy that house first or did I buy it second or how'd that happen? You know, or how did I buy this storage place? What was the deal? What was the setting? You know, cause I was moving so fast. I was buying 150 houses a year, uh, almost between hundred and 150. My most ever was 150. And I know that there's people out there that do more than that. I'm just telling you what I did. Sure. Sure. So, um, in summary, what are the different kinds of, so first of all, you do, you've done single family and commercial. Yes. Yes. 
and and I do raw land and mobile homes and land and mobile homes. I've done like anything that made sense. But I where you're going is and what I think you want to know is like so I started doing the the buy and hold being the landlord thing, and it, the money never hit the bottom line to me. It, I mean I see the bottom line and the bottom line was really fun to look at and it was really exciting. But my year never ended like that. It was always minus about 95%, if not 100% of what that bottom line was. So um, I wanted out and I hired someone with my last $10,000 because I, where I had these houses, no one could qualify for a new loan. And I started to get real scared that I was going to be stuck with all these, these naggy, whining, bitching people who weren't paying and weren't honoring their word and they weren't paying their rent and calling me about everything. So I hired this guy to get me out to try to save my reputation and my credit and get me out. And I took my last $10,000, which was 20 years, 23 years ago. So $10,000 was worth a lot more back then, but it doesn't matter when it is, when it's your last $10,000 is a lot of money. And um, so he says, I know how to get you out of this, but it's not going to take very long. I don't want you to be mad at me when I show you and like you get it in five minutes and it's over and you paid me 10 grand. I says, well, if you show me how much will I, will I make? I said, I'm supposed to make $7,500 a month in the rent business. I was just hoping to make half of it, but I'm not even making half of it. I'm making, I think I lost a thousand dollars last year. He says, I said, so if I pay you the 10 grand, how much am I going to make of that 7,500 every month? He said, you'll make it all and more. I said, well, that's only like a month and a half and I got my money back. I mean, why would I argue with that? He says, cause it's not, it's not overly complicated, but you are just missing a few pieces here. And I know how to get you those few pieces. And so he told me, and in uh, four months, I'd owner financed my 25 houses that I was renting. I owner financed them, most of them to the people that lived in it, but the other half, I just kicked them out and found somebody else. I didn't even believe in the concept and they gave me 3000 down a piece. And that today I get around 10,000. Today I get around 10,000 down normally. Um, but I didn't even believe in the concept really. I was just doing what this guy told me to, but I didn't think it would work. So I collected about $3,000 down from 25 people. So if you do the math, I had $75,000 in, they weren't non-refundable. I mean, they weren't refundable rent deposits. It was non-refundable down payment money and they made the rent with the taxes and the insurance you know basically what i was going to clear i made i made the mortgage payment basically what i was going to clear and rent and within about 90 days the 7500 bucks was hitting my account and there was no reason for it to leave because it wasn't my house when people said their toilet was broken they, they said my toilet's broken i said yeah your toilet is broken uh, just send the check, you know, send the well, so, so let's, so let's catch up here for, for a second, Mitch. So you had these houses, 25 houses mm -hmm. and the guy that is giving you this advice. Okay. So you had tenants and toilets, you were renting them out. You I'm supposed to make, I'm supposed to make $300 a house times 25. I'm supposed to make $7,500 a month. Even I wasn't so stupid to think I was going to clear it all. I just, I was counting on 3,500 a month so I could live. So I just right. a little, le little less than half is all I wanted, or a little, you know, half, less yeah. than half. And so, I didn't even do that. So putting aside the $75,000 yeah, that was raised right away, they gave you 3000 each. Would you say what changed the cash flow the most? I mean, you kept their monthly payments when you owner financed these houses at the same they were renting them for? Yes, pretty much dead even. All right. So would you say the big difference in cash flow is that you got rid of all the repairs? I didn't have any repairs. All I, the only thing that changed that payment was if they were late, I got a late fee. Gotcha. Gotcha. Which was, which was up, you know? So uh, all of a sudden I just, and I traded all that time that I was doing as a, as a property manager, I just went and found another house. You know, the downside of owner financing houses is I don't get the appreciation or the depreciation. That's the two downsides. Right, right. Well, now, um, and so, so, yeah, go, go ahead. Well, now we can talk about that though. I, every day I buy a house for, um, you know, 50, 50, 60, 65,000. 65,000 is the, 65% is the most I'll pay of the value of a house. I average 58%. So on a $100,000 house, the most I'll pay is 65,000. 
I average paying fifty eight thousand for a hunt for a house that I can own or finance for a hundred. And and so the landlord's going, well, you're not getting the appreciation. I said, well, I bought a house for fifty eight thousand and I sold it for one hundred and thirty days. I mean, how much damn appreciation you guys want? You want to annualize that? You know? Yeah. Yeah, so so uh, let, let's stop here for a second and let's analyze uh, the, the deal itself. So really, first, you know what this reminds me of, Mitch? What this reminds me, you and I have got something big time in common. Well, we got a lot in common. But here's one thing in, in particular. So you had this adversity come along where you don't know what to do. You got it out. You, you want it out. You got this portfolio of houses. It's not cash flowing. You got a major problem and you're probably losing sleep over it and you're stressed out and it's like, what am I going to do? And boom, you get the answer. And boy, was that a blessing in disguise when you did that conversion. And what that, what I relate to on that is six years into my career in the real estate investing, I was relying on banks and mortgage companies. And then when I got cut off with no notice, you know, no notice. Uh, it's like we had to ask ourselves, okay, we got to find a better way, like really fast. And so going through that adversity, just ex as a result of going through the adversity, instead of choosing to quit, then it was like this huge blessing in disguise. Yes. Yeah. So it goes further than that. So all of a sudden I'm making the 7,500 a month. And, and we'll, before this is over with, I'll document, uh, we'll do a hypothetical deal with all the numbers so everybody can see how it works. But so uh, everything's coming in good. And then my phone starts ringing and these note buyers want to buy my notes for cash. Now I don't sell notes anymore, Jay, because I don't have to and it doesn't make any sense. But in the early days, the, you know, when this offer first came across my desk, I couldn't resist. Um, so the note buyer started coming and said, we want to buy your note. I said, what are you talking about? They said, well, that, that guy over there in that house, he owes you like $35,000 uh, for, for 29 more years or 20, 30 years. He goes, we want to buy that note for cash. I said, how much cash? They said, we'll give you $33,000 for that $37,000 note. I said, really? He said, yeah. yeah. I said, well, yes. I said, what would you do with 24 more just like it? I said, well, we'll do the same thing on the whole 24. So within six months of my, of my doom and gloom in the woods, scared to death, I sold all my notes and I ended up having like a half a million dollars in the bank. I went from scared to don't want to having a half a million dollars in the bank. I'd never seen the 70, I'd never seen $7,500 in the bank, which was a month's um, uh, collective rent. I did. I damn sure had never seen seventy five thousand, which was the money of the down payments, and I was already on the moon. And then they came, and within another month or so, I had like a half a million dollars in the bank. And then you know you never quit learning, Jay. I learned some new words right after I got that money in the bank. It's called IRS. In <laughs> So I was really high and then I got bumped down again. It seems like it's been that way since ever I've gotten this business now. You get really high and then there's a bump and then you get really high and then there's a bump. The, the, the goal is, is just to stay higher than the bump. That's right. That's right. Well, you know, what you just said, Mitch, reminds me there's one, there's many, but one in particular commonality among all the guests that I have here on my show. And, you know, you're one of the most successful that I've had here on the show. And that is resilience, resilience. The successful entrepreneur is resilient. Well, that book, Failing Forward to Financial Freedom, is a book about falling down and getting back up and dusting myself off and going, well, shit, that didn't work. What am I going to do now? I mean, what, how do you fix that? That hurts. That really hurt. How do I stop that from happening and just keep getting up? And there was people when I was writing that book said, are you sure you want to put this book out? And I said, why? What's the matter? They said, they said, uh, uh, you, 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 you make a lot of mistakes. You, you, you get pummeled a lot in this book. I said, I, so I talked to my wife. I said, am I looking like a dummy here or what? She says, well, it's the truth. I mean, that's what happened. What, what's wrong with the truth? And I said, you know, I like that. What's wrong with the truth. That's what happened. Yeah. Hey, Mitch, I'm drawing a blank. Who created the light bulb? Edison. Edison. Didn't he have over a thousand fails? Before he got thousand, he thousand fails, you know, I mean, my word. So there you go. So let's come back to this. So let's, let's, I mean, 
there's a hundred different things we could talk about with you here on the show, Mitch. In fact, I've already decided I got to have you back. So anyway, on this show, let's zero in on this owner financing thing. Okay. Uh, what, a, what a hypothetical deal looks like. Do you charge interest? You know, how do you keep up, you know, with, with, I, with, I got I'll, I'll give you a perfect hypothetical deal. And there's, you know, there's two kinds of owner financing. There's owner financing when you buy a house and you get the seller to finance you as the investor and you make payments to the guy that sold you the house. That's not the owner financing I'm talking about. I'm talking about, um, this is right down your alley, right, follows right with what Jay preaches. Um, it's, it's a huge portion of it. I borrow private money to buy my houses and then I owner finance my buyers and I owner finance them for 30 years with no balloons. I'm looking for 10% down. So here's a perfect hypothetical cookie cutter deal. Happens all the time to me. Happened 88 times last year. Okay. Awesome. Um, I average buying about a hundred houses a year, been a really, really competitive market, really hot market. So I only bought 88 houses last year. Um, I owner finance 62 of them. This is what an average owner finance deal looks like. First of all, I figure out I can buy a house. Uh, you know, you got to back into the rent because you got to know what you can own or finance a house for before you can start making offers. You got to know what your exit price is. So what I do is I have this formula and it's a rent formula. And if you guys going to get your pencil and paper, I'll tell you how I use the rents to back into an owner finance price because the core belief of the owner finance strategy is that I can take a person paying a thousand dollars a month rent. And if they have a down payment, I can, I can get them to be making a principal interest taxes and insurance payment for the same thousand dollars and be the owner. Cause I believe that most renters would rather pay a thousand to own than pay a thousand to rent. And that's my sweet spot. I'm trying to find the price range of house so that I can trade the rent for a principal interest taxes and even servicing fee payment. So that's usually in the houses, but 250 or under 250,000 or under. And so what happens is, uh, this is the formula. You take the rent and you subtract the, in, the monthly insurance amount and you also subtract the monthly property taxes. And that leaves you with how much this renter has left over for principal and interest. Now let's say it's $1,000 rent minus $100 um, property tax and $50 insurance. So 1,000 minus 150 leaves 850. That's how much this person has for principal and interest. Now I base everything around 10% 30 years. So if I back into that, what will 850 pay for? Okay, uh, hold it right there, Mitch. Hold it right there. You just said something powerful. You just said something powerful. What you said was 10%. So you've got all these people that are willing and excited to pay you. This is a question. 10% APR per year when if they could get a mortgage and they can't, but if they could get a mortgage on today's rates, they could, could, could probably get what? Five and a half percent from a mortgage company. Something yeah, like that. That's not their option. They're, they're not mortgageable for whatever reason. And there's a thousand reasons and it doesn't mean they're bad people. See, I, I look for good people that had bad things happen to them and the credit reports not forgiving them. The credit bureau is not forgiving them. I will forgive them. I can see where the mistake happened or the tragedy happened or the, or the firing happened. And I can see where the guy got back on his feet, but the, the credit bureau is penalizing him for that time in between. And they're not giving him any, any wiggle room. And I look at him with a brain and go, he don't have that problem anymore. Yeah. So let, let me, let me do go on a tangent for a moment and we'll come right back to where you left off. So let's go over here for a second. So you did 88 houses in the past year. That's a lot of houses. I know that you are involved in a lot of different business ventures and, you know, et cetera. So who does all the qualifying and who decides if somebody's going to buy one of your houses? Look, I haven't seen the last 300 houses I bought and I haven't seen the last 300 people that bought my houses. I have a 0 0.08 foreclosure rate right now for the last three years. Um, you know, I got people trained up. We look at uh, background, uh, you know, uh, criminal history. We look at the credit bureaus and we, 
we look at where they're employed and how long, and we talk to their employer, and we look at their last l landlord. Those four things, and I can get a really good picture for them. And then if they're, I'm on the fence at all, then maybe I'll have someone from the office like interview them. And we got like 15 questions we ask them that have nothing to do with, with the deal. They're just personal questions. Hey, are your kids in sports? Do you go to church? What, what, you know, I just got questions. I get them talking, and then, I'll, then we'll be able to figure out who they are and if there's someone we want to finance or not. So obviously, I'm just going to say, you, you probably, your team probably verifies their income to make sure they can afford the payment as well, right? Well, I, I'm subbing out all this stuff to a residential mortgage loan originator by law from Dodd-Frank. So yeah, we have to do that. But, but you know, Jay, just because someone doesn't have a social or doesn't report their income doesn't mean that I can't sell a house to them. It, what, what the, you know, in FHA and VA, it says, you know, you got to have 47% of your disposable income for your house payment. It's mathematical, okay? And you got to prove it up by the math. That's not what Dodd-Frank says. Dodd-Frank says you have to have a reasonable reason to believe they can make the payment. So if I'm financing a, a Mexican national house and he doesn't have a social and he's not even telling me where he gets his money, but he tells me that he rents over here for 1100 a month for three years and I go get a letter from the landlord says that he's paid on time for three years. Judge, that's my reasonable reason to believe he can pay because he's been, I don't know where he gets his money at all now, but obviously he's paying. Yeah, that's a good point. I was going to say you had a four point process just a moment ago. You said of pre-qualifying the people as to whether you're going to let them uh, be approved to buy a house. And your fourth point was how have they been paying their most recent, their landlord history? Yeah, and what did that house look like when I drove by it or someone drove by it? Because your house is going to look just like that house in 30 days. Yeah, good point. Okay, so let's come back to where we were. So let, let me recap to where we got up to, then I'm going to turn it back over to you. So you're, you're funding the deals that you buy, most of them with private money. You then turn around, sell them with owner financing, and you were, you were starting to get into the deal. So you're looking for a minimum of 10% down, right? on average, yes, and you're charging 10% interest, okay? And you said that you take, if it's $1,000 a month, you take off the insurance, you take off the property taxes and whatever's left per month, that would be rent, which is actually now gonna be principal and interest payment to your company, pick it up from there, you're backing into okay. it. So, so I'm back, this, the, the, rent, the rent in the neighborhood for this house is $1,000. I, I wanna buy this house and so, I looked up and I found that the insurance and the taxes was $150 a month, the insurance and the property taxes. So take a thousand and subtract that 150, come up with 850. Now you can either go find a mortgage calculator, plug in 850 as the pain is the, is the principal interest payment, 10% for the interest, 30 years as the term and solve for the balance. Or you can multiply by 115 with your solar powered calculator that you bought at the dollar store for three bucks. That's the most confusing thing about this. You buy a, dollar calculator for three bucks at the dollar store. So anyways, <laughs> uh, so um, it comes out to be 97,750 bucks is how much they can afford to finance and come out with a, a payment of 850 principal and interest. So we just round that to 98 because I don't deal in those kind of numbers. I round it to 98. Now if they can afford to finance $98,000, what does that make the sales price? I just add 12% on top. So that's another 10 grand, uh, you know, uh, 12,000. So now, now that makes the owner finance value 110,000, give or take a couple. Um, we don't split hairs here. 110,000. Now that might be $15,000 over the market. It might be right now today, it might be right at the market, but it doesn't matter because this person can't be involved in the market in, an, in a natural way. They can't get a mortgage loan. So I, what I'm trying to say is, are you better off paying $110,000 and it's a fix for 30 years or you're better off floating around on the rent for the next 30 years. Well, the rent's yeah. not going to stay the same. Yeah. So go back, uh, go back a second there. You said you add 12% to it. What's the 12%? It's the down payment. I like to get 10, but I like 12 better. So I always start with 12. If I end up with 10, it's okay. All right. So, so, so let's recap for our viewers and listeners what you just said. So you're taking the, you say it's a thousand dollars a month that you say, hey, in this market, people can afford to pay by and large. 
you get you back out the property taxes and insurance, you got what's left over, you take that amount and where did you what did you multiply times 1.15? No, I multiplied by 115. I mean what I mean 115. I multiplied the 850, which was the amount they had for principal and interest after the taxes and insurance. The, the man had 850 in that scenario. 1,000 minus 150 for insurance and taxes leaves you 850. That's how much this person will have for a principal and interest payment. Now I'm using the terms 10% in 30 years to solve for that balance, or I can just multiply by 115 and I'll be close enough. Now look, Jay, I wasn't smart enough to figure out that multiplier. I had to hire an engineer from A&M. But you know, when you're not smart, you learn how to pay smart people. <laughs> so you multiplied that and that came up with an amount financed. Yeah, so if they, that's how much you, they can finance, then what does that make the sales price? Well, we got, they gotta give you a down payment. So we're gonna add that 10 or 12% on top. I, I picked 12% because I, I really shoot for more than 10% down. I shoot for as much as I can get. 10% is like a minimum. So I add 12% on top in my per preference, but you can add 10% on top, you know, so 98,000 uh, times 10% is 9,800. I just call that, you know, 10,000. Okay. And, and, and so you're right around 100, $110,000 as a sale is the owner finance value. Now I did coin that. I don't know that in, you have the OFB, I mean, you have the ARV and you have the Mayo. I don't think anyone's been walking around talking about the OFB, the owner finance value. And, but today we do have the OFV. And so we're, that's my formula to arrive at the OFV. Now the OFV, the owner finance value is not the MIA appraiser's number. It's not the, the tax assessment. It's not the CMA. It's not the broker's professional opinion. It's separately, completely different than that. All those are based on comparable sales from people that could get a loan or pay cash. This guy is neither. The OFV is a number unto itself. And you got to go back to the core belief. Does a person paying a thousand dollar rent, would they rather pay a thousand to own? Well, in most cases, the answer is yes. And that's, we're living or dying by that core belief. It, it's like a tote your note car lot. No one gives a damn about the price of the car. No one gives a damn about the interest rate. They want to know, can I make the payment? Exactly. Exactly. You know, if they're paying a thousand dollars rent, then I already know the answer. You can make the payment. I already know you can, because I'm going to make my payment within 50 bucks, the same as your payment now. Gotcha. I'm just going to make you the owner. Do you want to be an owner? If the answer is yes, let's have a talk. If it's no, have a great day. And I need to talk to the guy behind you. Yeah. So let's talk for a moment about the private lenders and, and, and what part of the deal that looks like. So you got a private lender and just to make sure our viewers and listeners know what we're talking about, we're talking about doing business with individuals. These are not mortgage companies or institutions or banks. These are individuals that loan money out to us real estate investors from either their investment capital or their retirement accounts. So let's go back to, to step one, Mitch. We got this house. You and your team are going to buy the house. You're going to fund it with, with private money. Are you, are you, go ahead. We were, we were, on, we, were, we were in step one. Step one was what can I sell this house for? I got, I, I know I can buy it for, for 110. So for easy math, let's just say now I know that I can sell it for 110. I like to shoot for 50%. I like to buy my houses for 50%. Not really because it, it I mean, it's a nice margin. It might be a, a little overzealous to go at 50%, but here's the thing. I can divide by two really good, Jay, so I, that's why I go with it. You know, 110, I need to do it for around 55. <laughs> I, can, I can divide by two like a son of a gun, man. I, I'm a good no. – there ain't nobody better at dividing by two than me, okay? There you go. I got you. I divide, so let's say I get it, and I, and I get a lot of them for that. Sometimes I get them for even less. Now, keep in mind, I won't go over 65%, but let's say so. I divide by two, 110. I say, I'm trying to pick this house up for 55000 So let's say I do. So I get this guy to agree to 55. I go to my private lender and say, look, I got this house I can sell based on the rents. I can sell for 110 owner finance. Will you loan me 57? I always borrow $2,000 more at least. And why do I do that? Because it takes me two thousand dollars to find this guy, and if I'm buying a hundred houses a year, and, and I'm spending two thousand to find every one of them, that's two hundred thousand dollars a year. That that if I don't get it back, I'm leaving laying around in my deals. And it took me a long time to figure out why I always seem so strapped. You know what I mean? Or or more strapped? 
is I was leaving this $2,000. So I borrowed 57. I put $2,000 in my left hand pocket, which is tax deferred because it's borrowed money. And my payment's about 350 for easy math, okay? Now, this guy owes me 850 and he gives me 12,000 down. So he gives me 12,000 down. I put that 12,000 in my right pocket. So between my right and my left pocket, I got $14,000 in my pocket. And, and my buyer owes me 850 a month and I owe my lender 350. So I'm keeping 500 in the middle and I'm, and I'm not a landlord. I, I, it's not my toilet. There's not going to be a phone call saying, hey, I'm the air conditioner man and you got to give me some of that 500. It's not going to happen. Matter of fact, if you're out there in the audience and you have a mortgage payment, I want you to try experiment with me today. Call up the mortgage company and tell them your air conditioner doesn't work and you want them to send someone over and see what they tell you. Right. <laughs> exactly. So the private money that you're borrowing, are you borrowing that unsecured or secured? Non-recourse collateral only. And here's a nice little hint and tip. Oh, wait a minute. You got, you got to tell the viewers and listeners what you just said and what that means. Well, it's collateral only, which means you either get paid the, the terms that we agreed on. I send you a check every month as agreed, or you get my house. Right. And, so there, so the, and if you don't like my house, when people go, well, well, is your credit any good, Mitch? I say, that's irrelevant. Uh, you should make this loan to Charles Manson when he was alive because the best thing that'll ever happen to you is that you don't get paid because you're going to get my $110,000 house for $57,000. Yeah. Uh, 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 now I understand you don't want a house, but that's pretty good security. You know what I mean? As far as risk reward goes, this is really, and we got to be careful here because these sec rules, right? You can't guarantee nothing. There's nothing for sure, but that's a pretty, pretty bold risk reward scenario where you loan someone, you loan Mitch Steven 57,000. And if Mitch Steven doesn't pay you, you get a $110,000 house. That ain't bad. Yeah. So when you borrow the money from the private lender, you're giving your private lender a first mortgage. Yes. Yes. A first lien. And I borrow my money. Here's my terms. You might want to write this down. I borrow my money right now. I have $14 million of private people's money. Uh, uh, 8% interest only five years, non-recourse, collateral only loan. Non-recourse means if I don't pay you, you can't sue me. You can't give me a judgment. You can't, you can't take me to court. You just got to foreclose on my house. But you know, Jay, if I ever couldn't make my payments, I'll walk the deed over to someone. You know what I mean? I'm not going to scream, scream out. Those people that collect money and don't make payments, those, those people need to be hung. Back in the old West, they'd have tarred and feathered them and shot them. <laughs> That's right. So you, you give your private lender the first mortgage. Now you take that property and you're going to sell it owner finance to a buyer. So what, uh, so uh, how does the security work on that? So this is how it looks. I, I, my, my lender gives me $57,000 in the scenario in a first lien position on that house. And then he allows me to wrap it. That's another scenario. That's another one of my terms. It must be wrappable. You will allow me to sell this house on payments and you'll allow me to keep my loan with you, Mr. Private Lender. And they all agree. So, all right, so, 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 so let's, when, I sell, when I sell the house for 110 with 12,000 down, they still owe me 98. But my, my note is in the second position behind my lender. In first position, and now your note is in second position uh, from your buyer to you. Right? Yes, it, it, it's a very special mortgage. It's called a wraparound mortgage. And, and in that mortgage, it discloses to my buyer his risk that, that, that Mitch Steven owes someone too, and there could be problems if Mitch Steven didn't pay. That's, that wraparound mortgage discloses who's owed, how much is owed, how long it's owed, everything to, to my buyer. Now, you think that would scare the hell out of people, right? It, I, I, I've done it thousands and thousands of times. Uh, yeah. People accept the fact that they have to, to, to make some concessions when they can't get a loan on their own. You know what I mean? Exactly. Obviously they do. And so yeah. that wraparound, why they call it a wraparound mortgage is my mortgage to my buyer, he sends me a payment. I send a payment to my lender. He doesn't send me a payment. I still got to send the payment to my lender, but my mortgage wraps around my private lender's mortgage. It wraps around it. That's <clears throat> exactly. why they call it a wraparound mortgage. 
Exactly. So now uh, there's one thing you said a moment ago that some of the viewers and listeners are probably scratching their head about, and that is you, you got a five-year note from your private lender on, on buying the, the house. Now you're selling it on a 30-year note. What happens after the first five years is up and gone? Okay, well, let's just take the, let's take the worst case scenario, which by the way, I want to tell you right up front, this has never happened to me it, it, and, it, and I never planned for it to happen. But the worst case scenario is I put 2,000 in my pocket when I got the loan. I put 12,000 in my pocket when I got the down payment and I collect 500 a month positive cash flow. The difference between 850 and 350 every month for 60 months, which is $30,000. So between the down payment and the other thing and the, and the payments, I've collected 30 plus 14, $44,000. And if I have to hand the deed back to my lender at, after 60 months, that's as bad as it gets. Game Thanks. over. Made $44,000 on a house over five years, I'm done. Now that's never happened in my life because I know if I hand those, if I hand those houses back to my lenders, they're gonna quit lending to me. So it's never happened to me. But if that's the worst thing that would happen, everybody's fine. Okay? Exactly. But now you can sell these notes, you can refinance these notes, you can get, you can, you can um, replace one lender with another lender. It would take 17 and a half years before the people that owe me owe the same amount to me as I owe my lender. What would this house be worth in 17 years? What would this note be worth? How liquidatable? What's the average mortgage in America last eight years? Something happens. They refi, they die, they pay off, they win the lottery, they pay it down. So, you know, this, things happen. Um, if you think that you're going to collect for 30 years on a mortgage, you're wrong. But let's also yeah. look at this, though. If you go the long way, $500 a month, this is where the wholesalers are killing themselves. Because they haven't learned how to find private money, right? They're doing a one-time shot. Now, what is the average wholesale fee? I just made $14,000 up front on this owner finance strategy. Do you think that's a pretty reasonable average wholesale fee? I think it might even be a little high. It actually is high. The, the last statistic I heard, and, and I'm in this mastermind with 150 high-end real estate investors and a bunch of them are wholesalers. I mean, some of them do 1,000 wholesale deals a year. Average is $12,000 across the board. Okay, so look at this scenario. You wholesalers are going to make you sick right now because you haven't mastered the art of raising private money. You are leaving the back half on the, you're walking away from the back half. And let's look at the back half. I'm owed $500 positive cash flow, of which I am not a landlord, for 360 months. That's $180,000 friggin' dollars that you're not going to be able to put your hands on or even have the chance to get because you haven't learned how to raise private money. And that ought to scare the living hell out of you. You ought yeah. to ask yourself, what the hell am I doing flipping houses and wholesaling houses when if I own or finance them and if I could master the art of raising private money, I could make an extra $180,000 on every transaction, average, okay? So there's no, there, when I tell you I'm a multi, 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 multi millionaire, you can figure it out real easy that I'm not lying. You do 100 houses, and at the end of it, every one of them owes you 150 to 180,000 in the future. You become a multimillionaire within, you know, 20, 30 transactions. I tell you what, Mitch. When we look at your balance sheet and we look at accounts receivable, it's yes. probably a pretty big number. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just hoping they don't ever get to that thing where you can Google Mitch Stevens net worth because I don't really want people to know. <laughs> I hear you, man. So on, on the deal here, uh, so that's a, that's a good point on the wholesale. Like these houses that you're buying, you're doing, you did 88, you say in the past year, these houses, are you buying them and, and uh, are you rehabbing no, it? No, my favorite strategy of all time. And you're going to love this. Buy it. Don't fix it owner finance it for double and watch the guy making new payments go over budget fixing up your collateral it's the most beautiful plan on the planet right. on the planet because where's all the risk jay it's always in the rehab you know i i i i don't invent much i invented maybe i invented the ofv and i also invented the second half of this bumper sticker now we all know the first half of the bumper sticker it says you make your money when you buy well mitch steven printed the other sentence at the bottom and you lose it in the rehab 
Right. You lose all that money you made when you bought it, you lose it all in the rehab. So if you don't do a damn rehab, but look, Jay, it's really hard to have materials walk off your job when you don't rehab a job. That's true. People, people can't go over budget, charge you double when you don't give them a job. People, That's right. And, and how many people, I wish I could see a show of hands, how many people that do a rehab go over budget? If your hand's not right up now, you're a liar or you just haven't done, you've only done like one carpet rehab and that's it. Because everyone I know goes over, including me after 22 years and thousands of deals, I still can't hit a budget because you just never know what you're getting into. And, and, and when you don't do a rehab, you, you can't go over budget. And that's it's so right. much more fun to watch these other people go over budget. Because I, I, I sell them the house, I said, look, when I sell you the house, it's going to take 20000 to repair it. They go, oh no, I can do it for ten. I said, no, it's going to cost you 20000 I know. They said, no, I can do it for ten. You know, they're in it, you know, about six months later, they're in it for $18,000 and they're still $4,000 short. And it's so much more fun watching them go over budget on their rehab, fixing up my collateral than it is for me to go over budget trying to flip a house. Yeah. So Mitch, the viewers and listeners, here's what they want to know now. Mitch Stevens, where in the world can I find houses for 50 cents on the dollar and sell them as is? Where there is chaos. I live where there's chaos. You know, so people go, well, the market's really hot. Who the hell selling their house for, for um, you know, 50% off? Well, the market's not hot for people that are dying, divorcing, have health issues, getting transferred. You know, maybe they won the lottery. You know, not all chaos is bad. You know, when you win the lottery, for tens of millions of dollars, that's a form of chaos. Now, it can be good or bad, but right at first, it's not bad. Yeah. You know, and people have walked away from things because they got inheritances and they don't need this piece of crap anymore. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or I don't want it, I, or, I, or I have bad memories, or something happens in a house that they don't want to face anymore, death or, 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 you know, abuse or some kind of thing. There's a lot of reasons. There's a lot of reasons. And so where, where we find these deals, is we live where the chaos happens. I live in that chaos. I'm a professional. I'm a professional. I'm like Thigpen on the on the chart. I just there's just chaos around me all the time. So, what's your favorite marketing method right now for uh, locating motivated sellers? Just outbound calling. Outbound calling. Yeah, um, I've been hearing over the past uh, year more and more high end. Um, Real estate investors such as yourself are doing a lot of outbound calling. So are they, uh, is your team or virtual assistants or whatever doing outbound calling to people that, that already have their house like listed as a FISBO? No, we're dealing with people in chaos, people behind on certain, on anything. People are getting nuisance and abatements or residential property code violation uh, judgments put on their property. Indicators that people are having problems behind in property taxes. Um, uh, 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 filed for a um, loan modification, you know, anything that, any hint that they're struggling with the property, then uh, we're calling them. And then we do the postcard mailings and the other touches after we've reached a semi-interested party, someone who's not, who's answered the phone and hasn't cussed us out. And then yeah. we start staying in touch with them, uh, a lot less of them, and, and I can stay in touch with them better and have a good conversion rate. Yeah. So you may not know this because you may have a team member doing it, but um, do you know what skip trace service your team is now using to locate people's phone numbers to call them? Yeah, we, we use TLO. TLO. I was going to say TLO is a big one out there. Well, it's not easy to get and you need to, you know, you need to talk to some people before you start applying for this stuff because you don't get many chances. They, they just, if they don't like you, they shut, they'll shut you off. Uh, exactly. You know, so you need to learn about how to get approved because if you make any mistakes along the way, you just don't walk back in and reapply. Exactly, exactly. Um, well, my lands, Mitch, we are just about out of time and we, you and me could keep going here for another hour or two. Uh, so let me wrap up with uh, some quick fire questions here and then you're gonna be able to give away the, uh, the free gift that you got um, here, here at the end of the show. So, um, um, What's the best advice you got for a new real estate investor that's never done a deal? Um, I think you use the internet to get as much free information as you can. Uh, you always check references on everybody. Once you find, once you find a strategy that, 
then stop looking at everything else and start drilling down. Once you're sure that it's for you, once you're sure that that's the strategy that you're going to do, then stop with the free stuff and, and, and hire someone that's the best at what they do in that strategy for one of the best and pay them. Because you're either going to pay the street or you're going to pay the mentor. And the street's relentless and, and the street will crush you. And the stress of the street, learning by the street. You know, I graduated from La Calle U, Jay. Oh, yeah. What's that? La Calle means the street in Spanish. I'm going to get a ring made that says La Calle U. <laughs> Everybody else, I didn't go to college, but I'm going to get a college ring that says La Calle U. And people start showing their ring. I graduated from AM. I graduated, I graduated from Alabama. I graduated, I'm going to say, I graduated from Kylie, uh, La Calle U, mofos. <laughs> so, so, Mitch, I hear you practicing what you're preaching. And that is, you just said, figure out this core strategy and stick to it. So you would say, would you say your core strategy now and has been for years, find the motivated seller, negotiate the deal, fund it with private money, sell it as is with owner financing? Yeah, you don't always sell it as is because sometimes it makes sense to do some paint. What happens is, is I got a line of houses and I got two good crews and they can only work on two houses at a time. So I got four houses going at a time. The rest of those houses are for sale as is. If I get to them, I'll rehab them. But 50, 60% of them I never get to. Because yeah. I sell them while they're in line as is. I sell them as is while they're in line. So yeah. a lot of people think I don't do rehabs or that I'm against rehabs. I'm not. It makes sense sometimes to put a coat of paint some carpet because it doesn't cost that much and it ups the value a lot. But, but, but when I got a house that's really major, I don't like to do major, major $50,000 rehabs anymore. I just put a price on it that leaves some room for the other guy and I let him make payments and I'm watching him put $50,000 into my collateral. And it's, and when he gets done, that note is like instantly liquidatable. If I sold notes, I don't sell notes anymore, but you know, yeah, but do, exactly. the math. do the math. If you have 250 people that owe you uh, at least $500 a month, uh, positive cash flow between what you got to pay out and what you collect. How much money is that? 250 yeah, that, times five. That's a hundred and uh, $125,000 a month. And pretty good math. Can you live off? Can, you think, you think that's enough? You can think you could eat. You think you could take your wife out and buy her a diamond ring every now and then, you know? I love it. I love it. Um, hey, one last question here, Mitch. Uh, these people that are buying from you, what are, what are you and your team's favorite marketing methods now for locating buyers of your houses? Um, Facebook marketplace. Absolutely. I advertise, I, advertise, yeah. I advertise wholly in Spanish. If you want to see mine, it's Casas Dueño a Dueño, which means homes owner to owner. And I, I advertise exclusively. Every one of my office has to be bilingual. All my salespeople are bilingual. And I just, that's my market. And that's what I like. And, um, and I don't know, that's my sweet spot. And livecom.com, because when they call my signs, I capture their phone numbers and I got them automatically put into a text distribution list through automation. And so right now I have 8,000, Jay, right now, if I could pull up my phone and pull up my livecom account, that's L-I-V-E-C-O-M-M.com, as in live communications. If I could pull it up right now, I could show you where I have 8,756 people that have called my signs that I can text within a second for two cents per person. These are people that called my signs already, direct hits right between the eyes for two cents per person. And I could do it from my phone right now. And I, every time I have a new house come into inventory, I text them a little tiny URL that says, check out my, this house that just came into my inventory with owner financing. And I hit send. And 8,756 people that have already inquired about my houses get another text with the pictures and everything. And it's amazing. It's an amazing thing. Between the Facebook and that, I have, I'm averaging 12% down in nine days on the market. Wow. Nine and, days on the market. And that's, the, that's averaging the last 200 sales. Wow. What's, the, what's that resource again? Tell everybody again, that resource. It's livecom.com, L-I-V-E-C-O-M-M.com. And, and awesome. I, invent, I invented it because none of the places would do exactly what I wanted it to do. It has a lot of features. Uh, it has a lot of features that I've been, and we're soon to have voice drop. 
So you, wow. can, you can mass text. Actually, we can mass text with mail merge now. If you put the buyers, if you put your potential buyers first and last name in the spreadsheet, when it when you send out a mass text, it'll start out with hey Jay, hey Mike, hey John. You know, it looks way more personal. And we have an app on the phone where you make your recordings for every phone number. And we have um, we're getting ready to have voice drop. So you could do a voice drop to tell them to check their text to go over and look at their email. So you, you could get like three touches and one, hey, I, did you get my text? You know, you do a voice drop. Did you get my text? I sent you an email. It says my name, Mitch Steven, in the subject line. And so they got a, now, now they got a voice drop, they got a text, and they got an email they got to go check on. Man, that is amazing. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing the resource. Um, all right, Mitch. Wow. We're out of time, but how about go ahead and give, um, let's give out the information. So you got, we're going to give them, uh, what is it about the book you're going to give them? What's the name of the book and what do they get? I'm going to give them the first hundred pages of my life in a thousand houses, failing forward to financial freedom. It's a 400 page book. It has over 215 five-star reviews on Amazon. I'm going to give you that. So you don't waste your money. If you don't like it, don't, don't buy it, but if you're going to love it if you're interested in this. And then I also, you know, All right, hang, hang on, Mitch, hang on, Mitch. Let's give them the website right here. So everybody, those of you that are viewing on YouTube, we've got it right here listed. If you're listening, uh, you know, Google play or iTunes, it's W go to to get this first hundred pages of his book, go to www.jayconner, J A Y C O N N E R.com forward slash Mitch book, M I T C H B O O K. Go ahead, Mitch. Uh, what else we got for him? Well, you know, I was going to say, I think you might have a link too. Um, if you're interested in how I do this or you want to drill down more on my angles or my thoughts about this, you know, I have a 25 hours that we, 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 uh, I, I, I sit down and really try to explain it in depth in a much slower pace and maybe even some pictures and some videos and stuff. Um, and I think you have a link for that too. Yes, and uh, and people can get this training from you uh, digitally, right? Yeah, it's a digital download, 25 hours online, plus it has a members-only website where I, for five years, people have gone, Mitch, is this on the website? I said, no, but I'll put it on there tomorrow. For five years, if someone asks for it, I've put it on that, in the, that members-only website. It's very robust these days. Anything from my attorneys to uh, RMLOs to contracts to um, how different sales pitches I've used, different sales pitches I've canned because of <laughs> reasons, uh, the new new and changing laws. You know, I, I got unbelievable amount of resources. All the apps I use, all the programs I use, all the softwares I use, why I use them, um, and, and then their competitors. You know, I, I list. You know, you got a lot of choices. Sometimes, you know, I don't just list what I use. I'll list everyone out there. You pick if you want. Awesome. Okay, folks. So uh, check out Mitch's training. We got a special uh, website here for you at www.jayconner.com forward slash Mitch course, M-I-T-C-H-C-O-U-R-S-E, jayconner.com forward slash Mitch course. Mitch, thank you so much for being here on the show. You are amazing, brother. Any parting comments for our viewers and listeners? No, man, just don't ever quit learning and try to stay around the movers and the shakers and someone starts being negative, you know, listen for about a split second, decide if they got some merit, you know, and then move on to the good stuff. I mean, don't spend a lot of time in the negativity. Stay around people that are bigger than you and, and listen to what they're doing and do what they do. That's awesome, Mitch. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Thank you for viewing in. If you're watching on YouTube, uh, be sure and subscribe. Uh, you can leave comments below. We'll get your questions answered on the, regarding you know, real estate investing. Uh, if you're listening on iTunes or Google Play, be sure and uh, rate us, review us, and uh, we appreciate your feedback. I'm Jay Connor, the Private Money Authority. Look forward to seeing you at the upcoming event. Get on over to jayconnor.com forward slash money podcast. I'll be seeing you soon. Mitch, I'll see you at our mastermind in a few weeks. And thank you so much. Bye for now. Bye now.